What failed in the Soviet Union really was that here you had a worker's state, but because of the bureaucracy and the tyranny, the workers were depoliticized. They weren't allowed to discuss politics in the Soviet Union because if you criticized the Central Committee of the Communist Party, you were an enemy of the people. But I detect a depoliticization of democracy in Western societies because it's all done on the media. You don't have to do anything. You sit at home and you watch the posters and they tell you that uh, uh, this candidate's going up or down, the image makers and so on and so on. And we've turned democracy into a spectator sport. Well, you don't have to do anything yourself. It happens according to what Dr. Gallup may tell you. And I uh, see in that a, uh, an explanation for the fact that in the United States and in Britain, we don't really have a choice available to us. When Julius Nyerere, the former president of Tanzania, set up a one-party state in Tanzania, he was criticized by an American journalist, and Julius replied, well, you know, even in America you have a one-party state, but with typical American extravagance, you have two of them. And there's something in that argument that the difference between the parties on matters of substance is so slight, you can hardly notice it. I watched the uh, exchanges between Dukakis and Bush and you couldn't put a postcard between them as far as I could see. And therefore it may be the function of leadership in a democracy is not to queue up to be the next manager of the status quo, the man or woman on a white horse who's going to put it right, but to see it much more in an educational role. There was an old Chinese philosopher called Lao Tzu who wrote about uh, 40 or uh, 3,000 years ago and, and I have what he said about leadership which I found, I must say, very moving. He said, as to the best leaders, the people do not notice their existence. The next best, the people fear. The next best, the people hate. But when the best leader's work is done, the people say, we did it ourselves. Now that is a definition of the political function that you won't find in any political party in the Western world. And yet, and yet, and yet, you look at why Nelson Mandela was released from prison. It wasn't because he had a public relations advisor in the Robins prison telling him to get a new suit. It was because the blacks would not accept apartheid. Why did the Berlin Wall come down? Not because they had better public relations or more funding of their campaign, because you couldn't run East Germany without consent. And uh, I do not believe that in the long run, power does lie with those who have the largest military arsenals. If that was the case, there would never have been an empire that would have collapsed. And yet, of course, in the end, it is ideas that move people and commitment that makes people work and a commitment to the new world order will be the only hope of bringing it about. We have in this century split the atom and I believe that only the unity of the human race based on the mutual respect for the diversity of faiths and cultures of all peoples can control the dangers released by the splitting of the atom. I think it was uh, FDR who said this must be the century of the common man or as we would now say beyond the sexist language the common man or the common woman. If the next century is not such a century then I do not see much prospect of a new world order that will realize the aspirations that lead people to speak about it with such enthusiasm. Thank you very much indeed. If any of you would like to stay, uh, this is the bit I should enjoy most, which is the discussion. I uh, would like, if it was agreeable to you, to have one man and one woman in turn, because I find that's the only way of, of getting uh, an opportunity for, uh, for a balanced uh, comment. So if you want to make a comment or ask a question or whatever you like, I'll pick as best I can. So could somebody start? It doesn't have to be about what I've spoken about if you want to <coughs> discuss something else. Sir, yeah. So it does seem sometimes the media uh, serves the establishment. It also 
turns out that the media is oftentimes criticized by groups like uh, the anti semitic groups. Like who? Words, the media is sometimes blamed by anti semitic uh, groups and other people for their lack of success. Uh, in, in the United States, we've noticed the media being mobilized by the civil rights movement, by the women's movement, by the environmentalists. Uh, why, why should the media be against socialist ideas? Why can't it be mobilized by anyone who's got a good argument? Well, I, I'm not a believer in scapegoating anybody, and I think, as a matter of fact, there is a sort of conspiracy between political leaders and the media to see that neither discuss issues, because issues very often embarrass political leaders as much as they are unacceptable to the media. But um, in Britain, I mean, every newspaper of note is owned by six rich men, and they do not wish to promote in newspapers owned by rich men arguments that might threaten their privileges. I'm quite straightforward. We have the BBC, which is uh, uh, supposed to be independent, but is a state broadcasting organization. And the BBC was nationalized by the Conservative Party for much the same reason as Henry VIII nationalized the Church of England. I mean, he nationalized the Church of England because he wanted a priest in every pulpit, in every parish, every Sunday, telling the people that God wanted them to do what the king wanted them to do. That was why the uh, Church of England became a nationalized industry. And similarly, the BBC is there, really, to see that only permissible views are widely discussed. Of course, it's true you can get on if, you are, uh, if you present a good argument. But I think you have to recognize that, uh, as in any organization, they are controlled by the people who have an, an interest to defend. And uh, we are very far from having a balanced media in the Western world. That was what led America to leave UNESCO, because the Third World wanted a world, new world information order. And the uh, media proprietors said to America and Britain, get out, or before we know where we are, we'll lose our monopoly of the Third World. So it seems to be just realistic. And uh, the, the media play the role in modern societies, I think, rather comparable to the role played by the churches in medieval times. They control the thinking of people so it doesn't get far out of line with what the government wishes. Now, is there a woman who would like to put a question? Yes. Can you speak up? Because uh, there's a sort of buzz behind me and I'm a bit deaf. I should go to the mic, but if somebody could sit next to me and translate the questions, because I am quite serious to death and there's a bad, bad acoustics where I am, I've got a mic and you haven't. Well, I think the hope for democracy depends on whether we campaign for it. I mean, nothing happens automatically. And uh, I can think of so many people who have uh, a positive interest in discouraging democracy, it's going to be an uphill struggle. There's even, I mean, elected people are not very keen on it once they've got there. There's a very cynical French saying, which I often think about. Um, there is more in common between two deputies, one of whom is a revolutionary, than between two revolutionaries, one of whom is a deputy. That's to say, when you get to the top, you have a sort of common interest in fending off pressure for change. And I think it is an unending struggle for people to be taken seriously, because the centralization of power is so great in the world today, and so easy for those who have power to manipulate it. Secret services, uh, um, expenditure, control of education, and whatever it happens to be, that it is, that's going to be the battlefront. And I have a horrible fear that with the disappearance of communism, that the people in the West who had to concede to democracy to fend off communism will lose their interest in democracy because, or even their acquiescence in it, because they don't think they're going to be challenged anymore. So it's going to be a very hard struggle. But um, without it, then we will form, fall under some tyranny, whether it be uh, uh, of right or left is almost inconsequential. It'll be a tyranny. And so that's what it's about. It's about what we do, where we live and where we work. 
and not what somebody else is going to do, if only we'll vote for them and put them in the White House or number 10 Downing Street. That's the point I'm really trying to make. Sir, yeah. Yeah, I want you to answer a question for me as a right honorable member of parliament and also as a right honorable member of the human race. When our great president next year is going to take credit for the wall coming down, he's going to take credit for communism falling, he's going to take credit for the fact that uh, we went in and we liberated Kuwait. I want you to respond to that. If you could hear it, you know, what your feelings would be if he comes out and says something like that. Well, it's not for me to comment on your presidential elections, no doubt. All I would hope is that when the election comes, somebody puts the real questions on the agenda. Because if it's just somebody else, I mean, I notice now a lot of speculation about who's going to stand, who's the Democratic candidate, then what's going to happen in the primaries, then who turns up top, then what... I mean, we have almost obliterated political issues from, political dis from democratic discourse. So my argument is that you have to come in and explain. And I'm more interested, I mean, at my age, I'm, uh, well, I don't want anything for myself anymore. You know, I don't want office, I don't want cash, I don't want a peerage, I don't want anything except the right to speak my mind, to be a student and a teacher. And I think it's very important that somewhere in the political process, we rediscover that democracy belongs to us and not somebody else and that the most important thing is to understand what's happening and highlight the choices we have to make. If President Bush wants to claim the credit for the collapse of communism, well, he's, uh, uh, I've no doubt his uh, um, public relations advisers will tell him how to do it. My own opinion is that Western pressure on the Soviet Union had nothing whatever to do with it at all. I do not believe that the Russians said we'll live under communism, but now there are all these cruise missiles, we'd better throw it out of the window. They changed it because they didn't like living under it. And, uh, and it isn't external pressure, but internal pressure that changes things, which it confirms the argument I put forward, we've got to do it ourselves. And it certainly wasn't uh, external pressure that led to the Berlin Wall coming down. The people of East Germany just were not prepared to live under the, that regime. And so they made that clear, and there had to be a change. Whether they've stumbled into something that may be worse is again a question they'll have to deal with. So this theory that uh, we extinguished communism by having all this uh, nuclear hardware just is uh, totally unconvincing, doesn't persuade me. But how that argument is used in the context of uh, American presidential elections is for, I suppose, Democrats or other Republicans to put forward in their speeches. Just hope it has some content. Yes. Well, I, the first thing, I, I, I'm not here, you know, to tell anybody else how to behave. I can only convey such experiences I have in the most helpful way. I think the most important thing is to understand what is happening. And I think with the best will in the world, it's extremely difficult to find out what's happening by reading the media. I mean, what I said tonight uh, may or may not have been familiar to you, but at least it was a different point of view that I haven't read you know, in the British press or anywhere in this particular form. You have to think it out for yourself. Don't take it from me, think it out for yourself. Second thing I think you have to realize is that the way the status quo is maintained is by dividing people. Now, I don't know how it works in the United States, but I know how it works in Britain. We've got mass unemployment. So what the government do is try and get the employed to hate the unemployed. They say it's all these people living on welfare. So instead of hating the system that makes them unemployed, they say, oh, it's the unemployed who are causing the trouble. Then they do it with black and white. If a black's got a job, he's stolen a white man's job. If he hasn't got a job, he's a scrounger on benefit. So the, the whites hate the blacks instead of hating them. Then they say that with all this unemployment, women should go back into the home. 
because every woman who's got a job is stealing a man's job, so men hate the women instead of hating the system. Then they do North-South, and in Northern Ireland, the cleverest thing of all, they say it's all about Catholic and Protestant, as if somehow if Ian Paisley and the Pope had a summit meeting and agreed how many commandments there were, the problem in Northern Ireland would be resolved. <laughs> so, I mean, I think you have, the second thing you have to discover is the commonality of interest. Now that, of course, does take you into the socialist analysis. On what basis is there a commonality of interest? It must be the commonality of interest of those people who depend for their income on the selling of their labor, because that is the, the overwhelming majority. Then you have to uh, ask yourself, how can I so organize that that pressure becomes apparent, not just on election day? I'll give you a very vivid example. Mrs. Thatcher introduced a poll tax in Britain the most vicious tax that ever been invented. The poor pay as much as the rich. And there was such a row about it, the Tory party got rid of their own leader. They murdered her. We never murdered her. They murdered her because they knew they could never win with her because of the poll tax. So there you've got a change brought about without an election. And then they had to drop the poll tax as well. So I think when you look at how things happen, and this has been my experience, it always happens at the bottom. And the last place in the world to get the message is the Congress or the Parliament. When the Congress and Parliament have got the message, you know the public have made up their mind about five years earlier. So it's at the bottom that you have to start. And you organize, and you unite, and you campaign. And there have been some very, very significant victories, haven't there, of people who have actually campaigned and, uh, and brought about change. But I think, above all, it is the analysis, understanding why it's happened and not allowing people to divide you. Because while they can keep people who are suffering in one way and another divided, particularly if you could hate foreigners, that's the most popular form of division. So you blame, in Britain they blame the French farmers, and so you build up a sort of reproduction of the Napoleonic Wars. You've got to recognize the commonality of interest and build on that. Now, I hope that isn't too elementary a point, but I think it is substantially what you have to do. Yes? I'm curious what you might feel is the effect of the EC and the United States lifting sanctions on South Africa. Well, it certainly is very interesting to me, the lifting of sanctions on South Africa, that there's been an American blockade, a total blockade of Cuba for God knows how many years, lifting it on South Africa and uh, then uh, uh, preventing any foods or very little foods able to go into Iraq where people are literally starving or quite innocent. So although I think that economic sanctions have a role to play, and I would not be sorry to see economic measures taken to enforce human rights, but I think that it is simply a question of who uh, benefits and who loses by the deal. I mean, in Britain, the reason that the Conservative government wanted to lift sanctions was because a, an awful lot of the profits of apartheid have turned up in the coffers of British companies who employ people in South Africa, make a huge profit because the trade unions are illegal and wages are low, and bring it back and the profits of apartheid lubricate uh, the, pro the prosperity of the City of London, our, our uh, financial centre. So that again is a case for looking at analysing why things happen. Because people don't do things by accident, you know, we may not know what they're, why they're doing it, but they know why they're doing it, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. Now, are there any more women who would like to put a question? Right, anyone else would like to? Oh, yes, good. What do you see as the next mobilizer of military and political force if, when communism is to come, what would be the next mobilizer? What would be the next mobilizer of opinion? Now communism has gone. So they, well, I'm not sure that I'm very much in favor of mobilizing military forces under any banner. <coughs> what I do know, of course, is that when communism was uh, very strong, the United States used fundamental Islam to undermine communism and unleash the very thing that's now happening. Because, of course, that was a way of defeating communism if you stirred up Islam around the communist borders and inside. And I, um, I'm a great believer in um, equality of religious faith and so on, but I do not wish to see um, uh, fundamentalists, uh, born-again Muslims, or for that matter, some born-again Christians taking over the world, because some of the fundamental Christians in the United States scared the pants off me. I remember <laughs> arriving early one morning. I'm not talking about uh, that form of scaring your pants off. I'm talking about uh, being, being afraid of what I heard. 
I remember hearing uh, somebody, I've forgotten his name now, when I arrived from London late one night on a Saturday and I, and I woke up about five o'clock on a Sunday morning and I heard one of these preachers and he had a map of the world showing how many more nuclear weapons the United States required to defeat communism in the ultimate Armageddon. I mean, that was exactly like uh, the holy war that uh, was being preached from Islam. So although religious faith has to be respected, I don't want to see religion mobilized. I think uh, some genuine international forces able to be used without serving national power for dealing with problems like Kuwait or whatever, and dealing with other questions, you might deal with the, have dealt with the West Bank or Cyprus or one or two other examples. I think that would be worth doing. That would be a genuine law and order force. Uh, but uh, uh, in the end, it is about uh, trying to persuade people as best you can that they have a common interest in peace, because they do. I mean, it is not in the interests of anybody nowadays, except maybe for the arms manufacturers or somebody or another, but a tiny minority benefit from war. The overwhelming majority would benefit for peace. The money would be reallocated to peaceful development and so on and so on. So I would like to see people mobilized behind those ideas. And I don't know whether the nationalism is going to grow to the scale that some may fear, whether you would have, a, as it were, a nuclear weapon in Serbia or Croatia or Slovenia or Canada or in the Quebec or whatever. I just hope that doesn't happen. And I somehow don't think it will. I think that uh, it is true that with the collapse of communism, a big idea has gone. And when a big idea, right or wrong, isn't the point, when a big idea and a big center of power collapses, then a lot of other forces come out of the woodwork, some of which may not be very attractive. I mean, that happened when the British Empire was uh, uh, wound up. A lot of uh, the successor nations were pretty dictatorial in their character. And there was a problem that follows it. But I can't see any alternative but trying to explain to people as best you can that there is a common interest in a peaceful and just world, which is the basis on which uh, American and British democracy work. People think it is in their interest that it should work like that, and the Constitution was intended to enshrine that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not bad objectives, as a matter of fact, when you come to think of it. Yes? Uh, as I understand it, you believe that world history has been If there were no no hypocrisy, <laughs> I mean, you're talking about the human condition, aren't you, really? Uh, and uh, the human condition is such that people with power will think of anything to justify what they do. I mean, the double standard in language never ceases to amaze me. For example, um, we are telling the Serbs to get out of Croatia, the British government is, but there's a British army in Northern Ireland. Now, what exactly is the difference between a British army in Northern Ireland and a Serbian army in Croatia? None at all. But when we talk about that, we talk about terrorism. But when it's in Afghanistan, they're freedom fighters. And Mrs. Thatcher called Nelson Mandela a terrorist. That was her definition, because there was a military wing of the ANC. Now, I'm not exactly a pacifist in the sense that I have the moral strength to follow the Gandhian principles of nonviolence. But at the same time, if there is no justice, people may have no route to freedom but by fighting for it. That's always been the case. That's, after all, the circumstances of the birth of the American Republic. You got rid of George III and there was a, a war to bring it about. And uh, so I think you have to recognize that uh, people will always use reasons. But uh, for the ordinary citizen who tries to follow these things carefully, uh, the exposure of hypocrisy and double standards is a very, very powerful instrument. Um, I, have you heard in America of the BCCI bank scandal? Has that uh, been in your papers? Yeah. Uh, well, what interested me about it was if that had been a, the Moscow Norodny Bank, we would have had pages about this is typical of the drug-ridden corruption of Russian communism. Because it was a capitalist bank, it was due to the failure of two or three people who behaved rather below the standard you'd expect of them. Now, that's a fantastic double standard, but nobody ever looks at it like that. I mean, that is a major capitalist scandal telling you that the CIA used the BCCI to run drugs, to promote 
But the linkage of that with the economic system that promotes it never occurs, whereas when it happens in the Soviet Union, then of course all the lessons are drawn. So um, I find it very um, um, refreshing to examine uh, 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 arguments according to whether they are genuine or hypocritical, whether they reflect a common standard or a double standard, and that is a useful educational instrument. Because when you explain it to people, people understand it. They say, oh, I see, I never thought of that. Do you know what I mean? So it's a useful argument, but you'll never avoid. That's what Niebuhr said, man's capacity for evil makes democracy necessary. But there's the other half of it as well. Now, is any woman who wanted to, wait a minute, just give, yes. Do you know, I can't hear. Will you come and listen and tell me? Because tell it's. Me about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. Will it ever be solved? Well, I mean, there isn't an Irish problem. There is a British problem in Northern Ireland. That is the plain, simple truth of the matter. And uh, we have been in Ireland um, for several hundred years. Uh, in 1918, there was an election in Ireland, and they voted overwhelmingly for a united, independent Ireland. And Britain sent an army in and divided Ireland by force, the partition. Uh, the partition worked for a while, although it was uh, uh, never stable. And then you had the civil rights movement, Bernadette Devlin, and so on and so on. And then after that, there have been a whole succession of policies by the British government to deal with what they call terrorism. There was, uh, after uh, uh, partition, there was a Stormont government. Then there was direct rule. Then there was power sharing. Then there was internment without trial. Then there were plastic bullets, CS gas, strip searching, diplock courts with no jury, supergrass trials with no evidence, and so on. And they've all failed. Every policy has failed. The war costs a billion pounds a year. I mean, the biggest peace dividend pro rata in the world would be if the billion pounds spent on the war was spent on dealing with poverty in Northern Ireland. And I think myself it's coming to an end. I think the British occupation is coming to an end. I've introduced three bills into the British Parliament to terminate our jurisdiction in Northern Ireland. And I noticed an opinion poll published two weeks ago suggested that 61% of the British people as a whole favoured withdrawal. Only 17% think the British troops are doing any good, which I think is a, uh, an astonishing figure considering the propaganda we get about terrorism and so on and so on. And then after the British withdrawal, then the Irish will have to determine their own future. The theory there would be an immediate bloodbath, I do not believe. I think the bloodbath theory as a justification for imperialism is as old as any you've heard. Uh, and I have a sort of feeling the Conservative government would not be sorry now to shed that responsibility. Because it is expensive, it is a dead end, and uh, it may be that if you did have a new world order with a human rights element in it, then somebody would be knocking at the Prime Minister's door in London and saying, what about the denial of human rights in Northern Ireland? Birmingham 6, Guildford 4, people put in prison who were quite innocent and so on. It is a disgraceful story, but we are never told it. Uh, and as you know, if you're a Sinn Féinor, if you're a nationalist, you're not allowed to broadcast in Britain. I did a meeting with Jerry Adams not long ago, and he was on the platform as a meeting like this, and I spoke, and the television cameras were rolling, and the journalists, but as soon as he spoke, the cameras switched off, because it is a crime for Jerry Adams to be allowed to broadcast. This is in a country that claims that we are, you know, representing freedom of speech all over the world. It's a horrific story, uh, and I, fortunately, I think most people in Britain have now woken up, but it's been a long, long time coming. Yes? What strategy might developing countries take in the future in the face of U.S. and European community economic and cultural imperialism? What will the third world do in the face of economic and, and European-American imperialism? Well, I mean, I think that is the big question. Because the non-aligned countries, the 101 countries, were built to be a bridge between or an alternative to uh, the polarities of the Cold War. Now that the Russians have gone, uh, as a force to, uh, uh, to help them, then they feel a bit isolated. I mean, for example, India had very good relations with Moscow. Uh, didn't ever share Moscow's internal political philosophy, but Moscow was very helpful. Without that, India's on its own. 
Uh, and uh, similarly, with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, they're more vulnerable to the pressure from the banks and from the Western countries. And I think that out of the non-aligned movement will have really to be um, uh, welded and created a movement for uh, the new world order that is democratic and egalitarian in character. And I think it'll be some time coming because uh, whereas many of the non-aligned leaders were able to work together on the global politics, if you begin talking about equality and democracy, then it begins to get a bit too close to home for some of them. So you might find that it would be a, begin as a more popular movement, but spreading and growing. But I've talked to a lot of people o about this very subject, and uh, the ones I know in the non-aligned movement, which I've supported since its inception, are very, very interested in that. And I keep saying to them, if, when you set it up, don't forget there are some very radical people in the United States and in Western Europe who would support you, not governments, but there are people uh, who would be prepared to support it. And I think a sort of popular movement worldwide for these things will have to be fashion because the bankers and the military and the media and the industrialists are beginning to run the world unchecked. And unless there is a countervailing power, it's going to be hard a grind for people, but that is what the next century I think will, will, will have to produce and maybe the origins of it will be found already and uh, coming to fruition before too long. Now there was a woman, I, I yes. You talked about um, manipulation of the media by those in power. I'm curious, do you think that the Gulf War situation has had an impact Well, the, the coverage of the Gulf War in the United States I can't speak for because uh, I presume you've got very much the same sort of stuff that we... But in Britain, the manipulation of opinion about the Gulf War was absolutely gross. Uh, I mean, there were three opinion polls um, just in December the 10th, I think, when Parliament discussed the matter. Um, only 40% favoured the use of force. Later, just before the bombing began, it was less than 50%, and before the ground war began, again, it was below 50%, and yet it was consistently presented as being overwhelming public opinion. I had, I opposed the war very vigorously in Parliament, and I did meetings all over the place, and I had 13,000 letters of support and 400 critical letters, some of which were just abusive. Uh, but I never got the feeling that there was that generality of support for the war. Now in the United States where you were playing a leading part and more of your troops were engaged in the front line and so on, maybe there was a feeling, a rather different feeling, and all this avenging of Vietnam War and all that may have been a factor in it as well. But I mean, looking back on it now, to be honest, the killing of those people in Iraq was a crime against humanity. It was a crime against humanity. You can't... Uh, And uh, I think a lot of people now are beginning to realize it didn't solve any problems, because apart from anything else, there will never, ever, ever, ever be peace in the Middle East till there's a Palestinian state. And I say that as a lifelong friend of Israel. Uh, but there has to be a Palestinian state, and of course all the pressure to prevent that has been coming from Washington and elsewhere. And so, bit by bit, it will come right. But are there all that number of what you might call post-Gulf War, war enthusiasts? My own reading of what's happening is that a lot of people think that it would have been better if Mr. Bush and Mr. Major had spent a little bit more time on domestic problems instead of being seen on the golf course. Somebody said they thought it was the golf war. It was on the golf course all the time, uh, making all these horrific statements about military operations. But really, we've got our own problems to deal with. I know we have, and I, I, I know you have too, so it may be that this will turn out to have been a completely false dawn of optimism following General Sch Schwarzkopf's uh, final victory and so on. I think people say, well, what about us, and what about uh, our world, and what problem did it solve, and so on. So I would guess that the euphoria, if there was much euphoria, wasn't very long-lasting. Did one? Oh, I do, but then, I mean, the censorship of the media began systematically after the Vietnam War, because during the Vietnam War, when there really was coverage of My Lay and all the things that happened, they very quickly realized that you could never allow people at home to know what was happening in a war. I um, mean, the Falklands War was just the same. I mean, there was total new censorship, and in the, in the Gulf War as well. 
And so you can't let people know. I'm not sure how long the First World War would have lasted if the people in Britain had seen what was really happening in the trenches of, of, uh, of France, where in the mud and blood, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of British lives were lost. Uh, war is not something that is easy to maintain uh, popular support for in the circumstances of, of, of the time. I happened to be uh, working very, very late on the night the bombing began, and I stayed up all night listening to them, uh, American commentators from the Al Rashid Hotel and so on, describing it, saying it's just like the 4th of July, and I almost threw up because I'd just been in Baghdad, and uh, although they never told us, of course, um, between the Tigris and the Euphrates is the cradle of our own civilization. When I saw Saddam, the first thing I said to him was, I hope you realize that I realize I'm coming in this country to the cradle of my civilization. And uh, that country has been destroyed, completely destroyed, and the man is still there, and the innocent people have been killed. It's a terrible thing. Now, I wonder how many people see that now. I think probably more do than we have ever been allowed to know, because the media manipulate the extent of public support as well as manipulating the news in order to produce the public support. Yes. Um, you say that uh, there, will, there, will, you said there will not be peace, or there may not be peace in the Middle East until there is a separate Palestinian state. Uh, do you mean to say then that perhaps there is no hope for the Middle East peace conference? Well, what's happening in Madrid uh, is interesting because, I mean, they're meeting. I think um, Israel, which has been funded, of course, completely by the United States, I mean, without American funding, Israel would not have been able to survive. Uh, I mean, it's a small country, but a powerful one. It's occupied uh, territories uh, around it, which uh, uh, are as much of an offense as the occupation of Kuwait, if you take a legalistic view. But during the Gulf War, the American government had to switch its uh, support to the Arab countries because it needed them for the coalition. So Israel is in two senses really less necessary. First of all, it is clearly um, guilty of uh, occupying territories that don't belong to it, but also for the future American strategy in the Middle East, Washington has got to get on with the Saudis and the Syrians and the Iranians. So Israel may have to do something. How far they will go, I do not know. But um, I'm a lifelong member of the Labour Friends of Israel and so on and so on. But the, 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 the right of the Palestinians to their own state is as great as the right of the Israelis. And uh, that has to be recognized. I think if that was said by somebody of importance, if President Bush said, however long it takes, there will have to be a Palestinian state, that would be more important than these strange maneuvers in Madrid the exact import of which I cannot at the moment assess. But I think things are on the move. And I think the Palestinians will, will get to first place autonomy and then ultimately a state. And without it, the thing will go on. There'll be another Gulf War. And it'll go on and on. You, you can't deny it. Yes. Oh, well, there are two more and then we'll stop, shall we? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, yes, the um, major powers don't really exist, do they? There's one superpower left now. And um, I followed as best I could the manipulation of the UN. Uh, the Russians needed American support and got a Saudi loan, and that silenced them. The Chinese were bought off by being forgiven. The French were all over the place, although they were a bit doubtful, but the Saudis lent them a billion dollars, I think, at a critical moment. The Germans were not, are not a member of the Security Council, and so on. And I think the, the purchase of support, I mean literally purchase of support at that time, was what gave the United States its, uh, its, its capacity to say it was a UN war. It wasn't a UN war. I mean, Paris de Quere was never even told the fighting was going to begin. So it wasn't, didn't have anything to do with the UN Charter, which provides for a military staff committee and so on and so on. But I... I think the old idea of the five permanent members 
is probably obsolete, truthfully. I mean, it was at the end of the war based on the idea that the wartime allies, China, France, Britain, the United States, and whatever the fifth one was, would be the permanent people, and they would never use the UN against each other. But Britain is not a significant country now, neither is France. Uh, China is, uh, uh, is powerful, but not in that sense. Japan would qualify if you went on size. So my own view is we ought to move, as I mentioned, towards the ideas which gave birth to our own very primitive democracies of popular control of the executive, just as the Congress can overturn an American president's veto, so the General Assembly directly elected or however should be able to overturn an American presidential veto. Now, when you're moving into that area, you're, you're really getting into a, a, the point where President Bush might wish to leave the United Nations, not just UNESCO, because that would be the challenge to American power through the UN. But that's the route we should follow, and the idea of planetary protection as the main sort of charter of the UN, we are there to protect the human race, uh, the, the, the planet, so the human race can pass it on to future generations. That does merit a real international force, and on that I would be a strong supporter. Now, if that's the last question, well, yes. Uh, well, there are now two. Uh, how are we doing? Are we, uh,